All right, well, thank you everyone for having me. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm really excited to be here. Um, today we're going to be going through a Tableau conference recap. So um, you may recall the Tableau conference happened back in November. Um, so we're going to be talking through that and I'm going to be covering uh, some of the stuff that you may have missed. Um, so thanks for the intro, Nelson. I think you've covered exactly what I have on this slide. Um, but I, I work, my name's Sarah Bartlett. I work at the uh, at Red Hat as a Tableau enablement consultant um, on the Tableau Center of Excellence team. Um, so I work there helping enable users with Tableau. Um, I'm a two-time Tableau Zen master and a four-time Tableau ambassador. I actually switched ambassador branches this year. So I was a social ambassador and I'm now a public ambassador, um, co-leader of the London Tug and also the founder of the Iron Quest project. Um, so in terms of the agenda today, um, first of all, I'm going to cover the new product features that were mentioned during Devs on Stage. Uh, then I'm going to do a quick recap of IMVIS. And then I'm going to go through um, what I think are the must-see sessions from the conference. Um, and I'll be sharing links to all those sessions with QR codes, so you can easily like, click through um, and go and watch them. They're all about 20 minutes long as well, so they're re all really easy to consume. Um, but before I jump in, let's just look at some stats um, from TC at a glance. Um, so this year's uh, Tableau conference had an amazing 113,000 registrants, which was up from 100,000 in 2020. And that's just mind boggling for me. Um, it's really great to see so many people getting involved. Um, and the attendees came from a total of 195 countries around the world, uh, which again is incredible. Um, Maybe you had a chance to participate in Tableau Doctor at conference, but if you did, there were 990 uh, Tableau Doctor appointments completed. I had the honor of working as a Tableau Doctor uh, this year, something that's offered to Zen Masters. So it was really great to actually meet one-on-one -on -one with people um, and help them uh, with some Tableau feedback or help them through some Tableau issues they were experiencing. And it's always such a like, valuable experience to do that. So if you didn't get involved in Tableau Doctor, please do next time. The appointments always uh, book up really quickly. So but it's really great chance to meet one-on-one -on -one, uh, with Tableau experts. Um, there were 287 brain dates um, <laughs> conducted, um, which again, is, it's been mind boggling for me. Uh, so brain dates are the, where you can meet one on, in groups of about five to six people and talk about specific topics. Um, and I've seen that brain dates were so popular that um, people are still having brain dates now. So they're arranging these sessions kind of offline. Um, so that's been really great to see how the community has been connecting through those. Um, and then finally, there were 308 session episodes. So I think that number's tripled because um, each session was shown in each um, region. So the APAC, uh, EMEA and North America. Um, so um, yeah, 308 sessions in total. Okay, so moving on to um, the new features announced at Devs on Stage. I will say this, won't, this, this doesn't cover everything, uh, but this covers some of the key features that I think personally are really exciting. Um, and as always, you know, things may change. They may not look exactly like they do here. And um, these are just, I'm just using screenshots from the Devs on Stage session. Um, I would encourage you to go and watch that session, maybe after this today, if you are interested in, in learning a little bit more about some of these features, because I'm going to cover them really quickly. Um, so to kick off then with the, the first part of Devs on Stage focused on the core analytics experience. So this is primarily focused on desktop. Um, so the first feature they announced was visualization extensions, which is targeted to come in in H2 2022. Uh, so this um, is essentially a, a they call it an extension, but it's really just a drag and drop um, interface, which enables you to build complex charts easily without any, using any complex calculations. Um, so what this does is it brings in a new mark type that enables you to build charts such as flower or petal charts, like the one you see on the screen, um, sunburst charts, donut charts, Sankey diagrams, core diagrams. And I think that's just like the, the initial list that they're exploring building out other charts through this feature too. Um, so what will happen is uh, with this feature, you would um, select a, a new mark type, as you can see, I've circled it here. So in this case, we're looking at a flower chart. And then with that, you get something called a mark designer. And that enables you to fine tune every part of your viz. So you can you know, change the fill color, you can change the borders, the transparency, um, you can do a pattern fill, all that kind of thing to make it look exactly how you want it to look. Um, and if you've ever like kind of worked with custom charts in Tableau, you'll know that this will save a ton of time because uh, currently you need to structure your data in a certain way. You need to kind of maybe design each of the elements outside of Tableau before you bring them in as perhaps shapes. And so this is just 
I can see this just being a huge feature uh, for the community, but also um, in the workplace as well, because it's going to make charts such as donut charts such so much more accessible. And they're the kind of charts you see quite a lot in business dashboards. Um, and along with this feature, you'll be able to share templates uh, via the new Viz Gallery, uh, which they announced at TC again. I don't think it's live yet, but from there, you'll be able to kind of look at what other people have done, um, download what they've built, and then you can use that kind of their templates to share in your own work as well. Um, and then just an example of some of the charts that um, might be available um, through this feature, you've got a sunburst chart. This one's by uh, example by Lindsay Betzendahl. Um, the petal chart, I think this is an example by Sarah Burnett. And then just an example of um, donut charts here. Um, <clears throat> carry on with the core analytics experience. Uh, the next feature they announced was dynamic dashboard layouts. Um, so this is targeted to come in at H1 2022. Um, so as you probably know, if you build dashboards regularly, um, in order to create highly customized interactive dashboards, it can be quite difficult to kind of bring everything together and make it interactive in the way that you want it to be. Um, and you usually end up using some, a couple of hacks along the way to get everything working as you, as you would like. Uh, but with dynamic dashboard layouts, we'll be able to use parameters placed on the dashboard to control exactly what you see and when. Um, so in this example, you can see at the top of this dashboard here, we have a a breakdown by state and it's currently set to show uh, but that is the parameter so it will be a show hide kind of parameter uh, and here the, the way that the user would interact with the dashboard is they would come in and they'd only initially see this calendar view uh, and then they would select a date range um, in the calendar and it would display this container at the bottom uh, which then gives you a breakdown for those particular dates uh, a breakdown by sales by state and, and product but they wouldn't see those two charts at the bottom initially um, so this feature is kind of similar to show hide containers, um, but will operate using either a parameter or a calculated field or the two combined. Um, so it's much more powerful um, and I think it's, you know, it's much more dynamic uh, in terms of what you can do with it. Um, it can also be tied to dashboard actions. Uh, so you can show exactly what your uh, dashboard looks like and you can really control and fine tune exactly what people see and when. Um, and I think this, feature will be particularly helpful for anyone that has a dashboard where they want to control uh, which charts uh, are shown in what particular order. So perhaps you only want people to see a subset of your dashboard first until they've made some selections, and then at which point you'd want them to see some, some additional charts. Um, so yeah, this feature looks really exciting and I'm excited to play with it. Okay, moving on, another one that I'm particularly excited about, and it's something particularly basic, but it's something that we wanted for a long time. And it's the new view data experience, which is targeted to come in in H1 2022. Um, so uh, the view data experience is where it currently exists and it's where you, um, you click on a mark uh, and you can right click and you click to show more view data and then you get a pop up window appear uh, with the data behind that mark. Um, now that's the current kind of experience. As you will know, currently that, that view is pretty limited. You, you can't really do much with it. You view the data as it is. You can't change anything there. You can't reorder the columns or anything like that, um, which can be quite frustrating. So you end up kind of exporting it out to Excel or CSV quite often and then editing it in CSV. Now with this new feature, uh, with the new view data experience, what you'll be able to do is actually customize what you see in that, in that pop-up um, window. So you'll be able to, um, control what columns you see you'll be able to add in additional columns or additional fields you'll be able to sort the fields uh, sort the columns you'll be able to sort the data within the columns as well so you could order it in a particular way um, and just really customize that screen so you can get it exactly how you want before you export it to csv um, now that's in the initial release so in the future developments uh, and that would be i must say that will be open to everyone so whether that be um creator viewer uh, Explorer. But in the future developments, uh, as a dashboard creator, what you'll be able to do is actually um, curate that view data experience so you can define exactly how you want your dashboard users to be able to see that data and export that data. So if your data makes sense, it will always be in a particular fashion, you'll be able to customize exactly what you want, save it, and then everyone else will have the same experience when they go and, and download the data for themselves. So I can see this being a real time saver. Um, so really excited to see it come to life. 
<laughs> okay, so moving on, another feature that I'm really excited about is the workbook optimizer. Um, so this is coming in in 2021.4, so literally the next version. Um, so when you publish a workbook from Tableau Desktop, you'll see a new option to select um, prior to publishing, which enables you to turn on the workbook optimizer. Um, now, I guess at the moment, if you want to run any um, performance recordings, you use the performance recording feature. It then kind of gives you a, a workbook to show you the performance of your everything and how everything's running and identify any issues. That current experience isn't particularly user friendly. Like personally, I find it very difficult to um, interpret what the um, performance recording uh, workbook is telling me. You, just, you know, you don't really know what you should change to improve performance. And um, so this kind of makes that whole experience much um, more user friendly, in my opinion. So the optimizer will scan for your workbook and look for potential areas to improve performance. Um, it will then give you. Um, it kind of checks your workbook against, um, in this example, 20 performance check criteria. Uh, and then it provides suggestions on what can be improved, broken down into three categories. So you have uh, critical things. So these are things that Tableau suggests you absolutely should do since they can severely impact the workbook performance. And um, then you have some warnings. So these are things that you could potentially impact performance, but are less adverse uh, than, the, than the critical items. And then you get a list of things also that have passed. So these are things that already meet best practice uh, and don't need any action. Um, and if I go to the next slide, um, you'll see that and underneath all of these, you get a breakdown of exactly what kind of Tableau is suggesting you do. Uh, and this is all in line with um, the kind of like building performance workbooks, uh, best practices that Tableau have. There's a white paper out there uh, that you can go and look at today. Uh, they're kind of bringing that into the desktop experience. Um, and then I've heard that, you know, through these, you'll be able to click through to some more guidance on each of these items as well, so you can understand best practices a little bit better. Um, now, I'm really excited about this because I, I know work performance almost everywhere where I've worked in consulting um, and in my current organization can be a problem, um, especially with newer users when they don't really know how to put kind of design performance workbooks. So this I see as being not only a really helpful feature, but it will help educate people on um, how to design workbooks that are performant and kind of things to avoid. Um, and you get a, a, um, a score at the end as well. So you could track that score to see, okay, I've maybe passed 10 out of 20. What can I do to, in, in, to pass more kind of measures and you know make my workbook 20 out of 20? Uh, so I, I pass all those features. So um, yeah, really excited to see this come in. And as I said, it's coming in in 2021.4 as well. So sh we should be able to play a bit pretty soon. Um, okay, moving on then, uh, another one in the core analytics experience is the data change radar. So this is coming in in H1 2022. Uh, and this will monitor dashboards that are saved on Tableau Online or server to see if there have been any meaningful data changes. Uh, so this kind of works in the background. Um, it's different to subscription alerts in the sense that with subscription alerts, you, you, you get an email or some kind of notification to tell you that something has changed. Uh, here you will see the um, data change radar kind of icon pop up on dashboards where there has been a meaningful data change. And so that's your kind of visual indicator that something's changed, uh, at which point you can then go into the dashboard and kind of understand that a little bit further. Um, so it's constantly monitoring your dashboards behind the scenes um, and kind of trying to identify you know, anything that has changed that could be meaningful. Um, so from here, you let's say you've identified there's been a change through this icon, you could click through and click into the dashboard to actually see what's going on. Um, so in the, in the workbook, uh, Tableau will show a list of data changes in the new data changes pane, which is, appears on the right-hand side, right next to the dashboard uh, or the worksheet. Um, and in, so in this example, we can see um, that Tableau say there's been two marks with unexpected data changes. Um, and then we can see one of those is that Sean Miller has higher than predicted um, sales. So we can click into that and explore it a little bit more. And just bear in mind, again, this is all next to the, um, this is all next to the dashboard still. So I think I've missed, yeah, sorry, I missed out a slide, but there's the initial view is that you get a chart to show how, um, in this case, Sean Miller's sales have increased. So that's kind of telling you what happened. Um, but then we could actually, use the power of explain data, which is existing functionality in Tableau to help explain that change. So why did his sales increase? Um, so in this example, Tableau is giving us three possible ex explanations as to why Sean Miller's sales increased based on the other data in the data set. Um, now, 
from here you can go through and use the current explain data functionality but um, unlike the current explain data experience you'll see this is this is happening outside of the kind of the mark so currently to get to explain data you would click into a mark and click on the light bulb and go from there you can see this is all happening at the side of the dashboard so it's all kind of alongside your analysis which i think is you know much more powerful um and yeah so you you get these explanations and you can click through and, and, and explore that it, um, explain data experience as it is today and then in a similar vein, they also, they're also announcing Explain the Viz, which is happening in H2 2022. Um, so this highlights which data points might be interesting for users to explore at a dashboard level, um, making it easier for anyone to explore and interact with their data. So it's particularly powerful for anyone that's perhaps um, not familiar with the dashboard or they're not familiar with the data that's being presented to them. Uh, and again, this is building upon explain data functionality, but it's bringing it to the dashboard level and not that mark level, like I explained before. Um, so uh, to use this feature, you'd go into the dashboard that's published to either server or online. Uh, you'd click a discover button at the uh, top of the screen, which looks exactly the same as the um, explain data button with the light bulb, at which point it would pop out this discover pane on the right hand side. Uh, and then if we drill into this a little bit more, uh, we can see in the discover pane, it's telling us um, that there's been some unexpected data changes and there's a couple of outlier marks that we might want to explore. Um, so in this ex scenario, explain data will look at other dimensions which are not on the dashboard. So perhaps they're in your data source, but they're not being used in the analysis on the dashboard to help explain what's happening with the data. Um, and I think this is going to be really powerful because it could bring to light some analysis that maybe your dashboard creator hasn't considered um, that they could then you could then go back to them and say hey you know i can see this is impacting this perhaps you want to add this to the dashboard so i think it's a, you know going to be a really really powerful feature <clears throat> okay so moving on to tableau prep um there was a couple of new features announced of tableau prep uh, during devs on stage um, i've only got one in this presentation because otherwise we'd be here all day um, but the one that i want to call out is parameters and prep which is coming in 2021.4 um, so parameters are coming to tableau prep parameters in the sense just like as they are in in tableau desktop um, and these will really help uh, to make our flows more flexible and reduce any redundant work um, so with parameters in prep they'll be able to be applied to input and output steps uh, so they could be used to filter data and um, so in this example here um, in the devs on stage presentation they were looking at song data uh, and the parameter is being used uh, on a genre so you can you can filter the flow down to a particular or isolate the flow down to a particular music genre um, and then you can then use that parameter again when naming output results um, so currently in Tableau Prep, if you need to make small changes to just a few values, you'd need to republish the entire flow. Uh, but with parameters in Prep, you can run that flow for only selected parameters that you need to change. You don't need to change everything and rerun it for everything. You can narrow it down to those particular parameters that you're interested in. Uh, and then it can be useful if you need to run multiple the flow multiple times and have multiple outputs. Um, so if you think of the example of genre again, so imagine you're running the flow once per genre. Um, Without the parameters, you'd end up with multiple output files and you'd have to kind of name them individually, whereas here you can actually use that parameter in the output. So it would automatically apply the genre name to that output file, um, which makes it a lot easier. So really excited to see this in action. And again, this is coming in in the next release. OK, moving on to uh, Tableau Server and online. Um, again, this is just one of the features they announced. Uh, but the one I want to talk about is the slow view load request, which is coming in H1 2022. Uh, so if you're a Tableau admin, um, you'll, you'll be able to use this feature to quickly diagnose where things are running slowly on Tableau online or on Tableau Server. Um, so this new view, which is this chart here, will help us to monitor dashboard load times. Um, so you can use this to kind of triage system issues and help solve problems faster. Uh, and the way this works is that it looks at dashboard load times across um, your entire kind of environment, um, and then it sets a baseline. And then it measures um, the load times for each of your workbooks versus that baseline to see what's running slowly or what's failed entirely. 
Um, and then what you can do from here is you could just highlight kind of a subsection of the, the timeline and actually drill in um, and you get then this view, which gives you a little bit more detailed breakdown um, of those particular um, kind of activities. And then you can filter them and just drill it down to exactly what you want to investigate a little bit further. Uh, but I really like how this is bringing a more visual kind of um, element um, to the Tableau admins to use and um, just makes it, yeah, I personally think makes it easier to understand. So again, H1 2022, this is coming in. Um, okay, moving on to Tableau Public. So Tableau Public was actually part of Devs on Stage this year for the first time ever, I believe. Um, they don't usually get their own section, but a lot's been happening with, with Tableau Public. And the good news is the two features I'm gonna talk about today are actually live already, so you can go and use them right now. Um, so the first one is the Discover page. Uh, so this is available for either the Discover tab at the top of Tableau Public. Um, so if you log into your Tableau Public account, click Discover, what you'll see is this new kind of Discover experience. And, and I think it's quite similar to what you see on something like Spotify. When you go into Spotify and you see kind of recommended um, playlists or artists based on your listening habits and also any new um, content from your favorite artists. It's exactly the same as that, but for Tableau Public. So you'd, just, you'd be able to use this to, first of all, keep track of Visit of the Day. So you can see the most recent Visit of the Day first and then kind of click into that Visit of the Day gallery to explore those in more detail. Um, you also have, um, kind of a, a feed of like new visits from both authors you already follow and um, perhaps some new authors as well based on your kind of Tableau public habits, the type of visits that you like and that kind of thing. Um, but it, it gives you personalized recommendations. So what you see on your Discover page will be different from what other people see on theirs. Um, and this is quite a long page. I mean, I've only got a, a small screenshot here, but if you scroll further down, you have um, curated topical channels, uh, which um, are used, they, they, they've created these uh, collections of visits um, based on different topics or different types. So you may see a collection of visits using radial charts, for instance. You might see a collection of visits, or sports visits, or music visits. You might see a collection of business dashboards, um, and you'll be able to click into this experience. And these are visits that may be from people you follow. They may not be. They may be from new authors. Um, but it will be. It's really great to kind of discover uh, content that you may have already may have missed otherwise in the kind of old experience on Tableau Public. And then what I'm really excited about is coming soon is that you'll be able to create your own channels uh, based on your interests. So. Um, you'll be able to create this experience even further. So I know currently I go through a favorite a lot of visits on Tableau Public, um, but there's no way of kind of organizing those favorites. It's just one big list. Um, what, and what I'm really excited about is that you'll be able to create collections based on things that you like. So I know I favorite a lot of business dashboards that I want to then go reference later. I'll be able to put those in their own channel uh, and perhaps I'll be able to put all their Iron Quest visits as an example into their own channel. Um, and you'll be able to you know, create as many channels as you like and, and really create the experience so it's something that's meaningful to you. Um, at the moment, those, those collections of visits are being created by Tableau. And yes, they're updated quickly, but they may not all meet your, uh, your needs. So really excited to see this come in. And then the other Tableau public feature that was announced, this is actually announced in the keynote um, at, at Tableau conference was the hire me button. So again, this is available now um, and you have to switch this on, but it, it literally takes a couple of minutes to do. It's really, really simple. Um, and what, what will happen is once you switch this on is you'll have this new hire me button, which appears on your Tableau public profile. Uh, we're showing off lovely Priya's Tableau public profile here. Um, but what this is designed to do is that um, really, promote your work and Tableau have recognized that a lot of people use their Tableau public profile as a way to show off their um, their Tableau portfolio and help them to land both maybe consulting work or even new employment opportunities. And um, so here, I think the disconnect before was that you could look at someone's Tableau public profile, but you couldn't necessarily contact them. Um, so with the hire me button, you'll be able to kind of plug in your email details and then someone will be able to click the button and then contact you directly um, if they're interested in hiring you or interested in your work or speaking to you for any reason. Um, so, and it also flags to people that you're interested in that kind of thing as well if you set it up. So um, it's kind of a flag to say, yes, I'm available for work, just like you see on LinkedIn. Um, so I highly encourage you to check that out if it's something you're interested in. It, it's really easy to set up. It literally, took, I think it took me like a couple of minutes. Um, but yeah, take that, check, check, check that out. Okay, so I realize I'm talking really fast, but I've got a lot of content to cover. Um, so 
moving on to IronViz. Um, hopefully you had a chance to watch IronViz at conference. If not, I'm going to give you a quick recap. Um, so this year, the, um, the IronViz finalists were Lisa Trescott, Pradeep Kumar and Sam Parsons. Uh, and they were selected from 320 um, participants of the feeder, which is based on data plus joy. So we saw 320 visits published for that. Uh, and these were the top three scoring entries uh, or, or authors of those entries. And um, so for, I mean, before I go any further, it was really nice to see the diversity um, in the finalists this year. So we had Lisa from California, um, Pradeep from India, and then Sam from down the road from where I live. He's like lives about probably half an hour away from me. Um, so in terms of what they had to do um, in the final. Um, hopefully you're familiar with IronViz. I'm not going to go too much into what IronViz is, but essentially uh, the, the three finalists have to build a visualization in 20 minutes live. I say on stage, but it's kind of live from home in a virtual environment um, using the same data set. Uh, so in this case, the theme was music and the data was provided by chart metric. Uh, and they had a huge data set of nearly 200 million records uh, spanning several years. And it included things like artist popularity, metadata, YouTube listening data, and lots of Shazam um, data as well. So Shazam is, if you're not familiar, is an app where you can um, go and kind of it tells you what um, song you're listening to if you just hold it to like a speaker or something like that um, and it's a way that people um, discover new music and new artists um, now their entries were scored against three criteria um, and that's analysis design and storytelling um, so that the judges were really looking for them to excel in these three areas with their entries and um, so we go through the entries one by one first up we've got Pradeep uh, and his viz was on music discoveries um, so here, Pradeep used a custom color palette for artist pronouns. So like she, her, he, him, and the orange represents bands. So where you've got multiple members of like different pronouns. Um, and then what he did was he's really trying to look at how people discover new music. Um, and then the music they discover, who, who is the artist behind that music? Are they someone that... Um, someone that recognize, identifies as a, as a she, her, or he, him, or are they a band? And so his analysis um, looked at nearly 1,400 top artists from 20 countries, um, and just from those countries to understand how people in those countries discover new artists. So it was really interesting to see, you know, the breakdown by, um, by, by pronoun by region, because um, we can see in like most regions in this chart, uh, the majority of artists people were discovering um, identified as a he him um, but then in APAC the he him and she her pronouns were almost level which I thought was a really interesting insight um, and then the I really like this biz because you can really help find yourself in the data because you can explore your own country and see how people are discovering music in your country and the whole design was really clean the, the colors were consistent um, and it's, it's really easy to consume a dashboard that looks just really great um, so moving on then to Lisa Trescott, she took a slightly different approach and her focus was on breakthrough artists. So she, she initially used a logarithmic scale to compare the rank of artists. Uh, and this was looking at the data provided by chart metrics. So they use a, a cross platform performance rank. Uh, and from that, she identified three breakthrough artists because she looked at kind of um, their initial kind of YouTube views, and you can see that three artists kind of stood out, they, their YouTube views kind of accelerated through um, earlier this year, in 2021. Uh, and those three artists were Giveon, uh, The Kid, Lorai, um, I hope I'm saying that correctly, and Olivia Rodrigo. Um, and then she just focuses on those three artists to look at um, their, their Shazam um, kind of listening, um, the, the Shazam Discover kind of listening uh, history um, and you know their, their path to kind of that stardom really. Uh, she uses, uses the pages shelf so you can see in this when you saw this live she showed animation to see how uh, they were discovered over time and it was really brilliant storytelling to see it all come together and um, again I recommend looking at watching the video back because you'll see this it's much more powerful than just looking at a static, static image alone but again great design um, consistent use of colors I like how the colors really pop and it was just really great to see this come come alive uh, when she presented it 
Uh, and then finally, we have Sam Parsons, Liz, which is on the influence of tech on music. Um, and I must say that this screenshot does not do this with justice. It's it, the way that the biz is structured. Um, Sam used show hide containers and the collapsible show hide containers. Um, so uh, they enabled him to really slowly reveal a guided story. So you initially see this view and then you click next and that that kind of truncates this this view and shows another view and then you show another view and it kind of tells the story in a curated way um, so it's really difficult to take a screenshot of that because it, it only works really when it's being shown live um, but the way that sam focused on uh, the data was he looked at how um, new artists are establishing themselves in the chart metric top 100 rankings and how tech impacts their fortunes. And the tech here was really TikTok. So his data story demonstrated the power of TikTok um, and how artists were using TikTok to be discovered. And then after you know the, the, their path to stardom really through TikTok and then how that then um, showed how they performed in other mediums like YouTube and, and Shazam and that kind of thing. And um, so it was funny that he actually got to the same result as um, Lisa in terms of the artists he was looking at, but he took a slightly different approach with it. So those are the three entries. They were all amazing. Um, it must have been really tough for the judges to, to pick a winner, um, but obviously there was a winner and the winner was Lisa Trescott. So, um, and if you're on, congratulations, Lisa. But I was really excited to see Lisa win. Like not only did she build an amazing dashboard, she did a fantastic job telling her story um, on, on stage or in that live recording. Um, and it's worth noting that Lisa is only the fourth woman to reach a global IMVIS final. Um, so she's preceded by uh, Lindsay Poulter in 2019, uh, the late Kelly Martin in 2013 and Anya Ahern in 2012. But nobody or no, no female had won the IMVIS competition um, since Anya in 2012. So that was nine years ago. So it was so great to see Lisa uh, take that title um, and yeah, really, really happy for her. All right, so moving on, hopefully I'm, I'm good for time. Um, now I'm gonna talk about some must-see sessions and these are must-see sessions from my perspective. Um, obviously there's over a hundred sessions, uh, but it can be really difficult to navigate that um, the online portal where you can view all these sessions and know kind of what's good or worth, what's worth watching. So hopefully this will give you some kind of guidance on sessions you should uh, catch up on that you may have missed live. Um, and these are a whole kind of a cross section of sessions, but I've tried to pick sessions that are kind of applicable to everyone. Um, and you'll see a lot of the community sessions in here. Um, so if you do want to catch up on anything you've missed, uh, you can scan this QR code uh, and this will take you to the, um, the site where you can kind of search for all of the sessions on demand. Um, but as I said, I'm going to focus on, uh, I think, about 10 key sessions um, and I'll show QR codes for each of them so you can just scan them quickly and it will take you straight to the page where you can view that session. All right, so to start off then, um, the first session I want to recommend is Tableau Speed Tips. Uh, so this is the session that was presented by Anne Jackson, Lorna Brown and Heidi Kalber. Uh, and this is the, uh, if, you've, if you've ever been to Tableau Conference, you've likely seen this session before, it, but it's quick fire, rapid uh, Tableau tips. And I must say this, this year they went particularly fast. So it was like, really, really quick to try and fit as much as they could into the 25 minute um, or 20 minute slot that they had for their presentation. Um, this session for me is always a conference must see. I mean, you learn so much from watching this session and seeing the tips that they go through. And these are all things you can take back to your own work straight away. Um, the great thing about this session is now you can get it on demand. You can watch it at your own pace. So you can kind of consume a, a, a tip, write down some notes, maybe practice it, and then move on to the next tip. And uh, when you're watching live, you obviously can't, <laughs> there's no pause button, so you can't do that. Um, so I highly recommend watching this back, even if you did watch it live, because I guarantee you, you may have missed something. Um, but yeah, so each, each presenter shared some bite-side tips that you, could, you can take away. So definitely check that out. And, and while you're there, try and look for the um, previous steep speed tipping sessions um, from previous TCs on YouTube as well, because they're all really great. And I think uh, Lorna and Anne have, have collaborated for the last couple of years and presented similar sessions. Okay, so the next session I want to talk about is Find Your Voice, How the Community Builds Confidence. Uh, and this is a session presented by Priya Padham, um, but she also had lots of special guests from the community, and I mean lots. So she brought in lots of different people, uh, all stages of their journey from the community to share quick videos. Um, and the whole essence of Priya's session was um, 
was for her to kind of present her own Tableau journey, how, how she found Tableau. Uh, here you can see her first tweet and her first biz, um, but really how she got to where she is today. Um, and then she welcomed uh, familiar voices from the community to also share their experience and their advice as well. And really how, how they got involved in the community and how they built their confidence uh, by participating in the community. Everyone's journey is different. And she, she um, asked people to contribute from across the globe. So you'll see, and, and people who are at different stages of their journey. So you've got people that maybe have been using Tableau for a few months versus people that have been using Tableau for over 10 years. Uh, and they all came on to kind of share their, um, their tips and, and you know, how they got to where they are today. And it, it was really great to see. And I think this session for me was the closest I felt to actually having like an in-person conference because I got to see people um, actually like talk live that I've only ever seen through like a little image on on Twitter with their profile picture so it was really great to see that the, the person behind the, the Twitter profile or the Tableau public profile um, and it was really just a nice uh, reminder of how diverse and welcoming and unique our, conf our community is and um, so yeah definitely check this one out okay next up we've got minimalist designs for maximum communication by Chimdi Nwusu uh, and so Chimdi um, he started using Tableau Public around 12 months ago, uh, and, he, and he started participating in Make for Monday quite regularly. And we really saw Chimney's skills like accelerate massively in a really short period of time. Uh, and now he's building like visits all the time. They're, they're, they're all fantastic. Um, he has a very minimalistic design um, and really great design skills. And I mean, I think he was visit the day yesterday. So actually, I wrote these uh, well, these slides, or the text on these slides is taken from my blog, which I wrote after a conference, but I actually changed his visit the day nominations to four because he had a visit the day yesterday. But he's had four uh, visit the days in a very short period of time. Uh, and he was also a top 10 finalist in the 2021 IronViz competition. Um, so that during his session, he shows how he built his American Student Loans Viz. So it's this Viz that you see here. Um, and he does a live build. So he talks through every, kind of everything he did to get to the end result. Um, so, and the, and the way that this chart, this viz works is it's just a single chart. So it really shows how you can um, communicate multiple messages just using a single chart on your viz. Um, so I really highly recommend checking out this session. All right, moving on, we have the performance first approach to designing efficient workbooks by Ben Brusilli, who's from Interworks. Um, you may notice that I've got a thing about um, Tableau performance, <laughs> I mentioned it before, but this was a really great session um, in terms of learning how to plan, create and deploy dashboards uh, with efi efficiency in mind. Uh, so Ben shared lots of tips on how you can design more efficient workbooks. Um, and he really did cover everything from the actual dashboard design and considering the design when it, you know, in terms of performance and what kind of designs will impact your performance. Um, also how to build efficient calculations. So this is like the slide you see here. Um, and, and also like just understanding the data flow um, and what Tableau does under the hood uh, when it's operating. So you can really use that to your advantage to build more efficient workbooks. Uh, but there were so many tips shared in this session. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, he also shared some resources as well that will help you uh, reference uh, later should you need to, uh, to, to kind of make more performant workbooks. Okay, so moving on, it's we have the inclusive design, making dashboards engaging, informative and, and accessible by my colleague, Emily Kund. As you probably know Emily from the community, she's a Tableau ambassador, uh, but Emily has become kind of like a spokesperson for accessibility uh, in the Tableau community and something that she's really passionate about. Uh, and in this session, she highlighted the importance of designing inclusive dashboards. Um, so she really stressed, you know, how inclusive design can help everyone to access and understand data rather than excluding people. So I think a lot of us you know, inadvertently may exclude some audiences with our designs um, and just not realize it. So she really flagged some things that we could all be doing better when we design dashboards and some considerations that I personally hadn't even thought about um, when it came to accessibility. Um, this, this session was filled with tips and advice on things that you can do uh, in your own work to make your dashboards more accessible. Uh, and this is accessibility for all kinds of um, 
different audiences as well. It's not just things like for color blindness. Um, she really thought through everything. And she also touched on the screen reader experience as well and seeing how you can design better dashboards um, if, if you have audiences that are gonna be using screen readers. So really, really encourage you to check out this session. Um, I guarantee you'll learn something new. Okay, next up we have uh, Know Your Audience, Designing Dashboards with the End User in Mind. And this is by Tony Pragoff. Um, this session was actually one of my favorites from the entire conference. And it was one of those ones that really surprised me. Like I didn't, I don't know Tony. Um, I hadn't you know, heard of this session before. I just happened to see it that being streamed and I joined. And I was really, really pleased that I did because it was absolutely fantastic. So in this session, uh, Tony shared her experience of creating dashboards that didn't land with their audience. And she really shared some like post personal stories of things that had gone wrong with dashboards in the past, and then what she'd done to like, kind of overcome that and prevent that happening in the future. Um, so she mentioned those issues with uh, data trust, uh, or mistrust in the data, or perhaps she designed some dashboards that were confusing, that didn't meet their user needs and then weren't adopted. And um, so Tony shared lots of tips that, um, you can implement in your own work to ensure the dashboards are adopted by your audience uh, and really get their point across effectively. Um, and as I said, this, this session was just filled to the brim with different tips and tricks. So I highly recommend checking it out if you are someone who designs dashboards for other people. Okay, next up we have Make It Better, Tips for Better Present, Better Dashboard Design by Ken and Kevin Flerledge. And uh, so I don't, Kevin, Kevin and Ken Flerledge, I'm pretty sure, have presented at Atlanta Tug before. They probably need no introduction, but they're both Tableaus and Masters, uh, and they have a fantastic blog called the thefalagetwins.com. Uh, but in this session, they had built a kind of less than perfect dashboard, uh, and they used that as kind of their baseline um, to improve. So together, they went through each element of the dashboard and spoke about how or how it could be changed so it was designed better. So they literally broke apart every single um, chart you see here so this is the original so they went through and it kind of um really broke it down to say how you could approach this chart better uh, and then if you see the end result it's just completely different it's you know, you know completely transformed of all these tips and um, so i mean this session was great I, I learned a lot i learned about different techniques that i could try in my own work and it's definitely the kind of stuff you could take to work as well it's not um, anything, you know, it's, it's all practical advice um, to help you design uh, dashboards better. So I highly recommend uh, checking this out. This is like a shameless plug from me because I am in this session, but this is shush or shh, tab, uh, secrets from the experts. Now this session is far more about my co-presenters than it is me. I was kind of like the facilitator, uh, but this session was one that I ran with Tiho and Zifra Mexo. Uh, and bear in mind, uh, T is based in Singapore, I'm in the UK, and Ziffa is in uh, New Jersey. So we were spread across the globe and it was incredibly difficult to get us all on at the same time and coordinate this session. But I was really proud in how it turned out. And it was a really great session for me uh, to understand how um, T and Ziffa had both got involved in the community and understanding their backgrounds and really how they got to where they are today. They're both now Tableau ambassadors. Um, so in this session, they shared a ton of tips on how you can leverage the community to improve your Tableau skills, uh, regardless of where you are on your journey. So it may be that you've been using Tableau for five years, let's say, but you've never engaged in the community. So we really spoke about how people in that situation could get involved because T was in that, that situation. She'd been using Tableau for a while, didn't know the community existed, and then discovered the community through a user group, just like this one. And then her kind of Tableau skills skyrocketed because she found out about all the other things she could get involved in and all the support she could get from the community. Um, we spoke about multiple ways that you could get involved and um, how you can meet other community members and really how you can leverage all the resources that are out there. Um, so I highly recommend checking this out if you perhaps um, want to learn more about the community and the community projects and all the different ways there are to get involved. Okay, I think this is the last one I have. Uh, this one is Tableau Zen Masters share their best advice. Uh, and this was um, quick fire um, presentations from Zen Masters. There were so many presentations that they actually had to split this session into two parts. Um, now, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to record for this session, so I'm not in it because I was so busy doing my other session. And I really regret that because this session was fantastic. Um, so each Zen Master was given two minutes to present anything they wanted, whether that be um, live tips or um, some advice for people getting involved. Just they had 
uh, free reign to do anything they would like. And so as a result, the presentations included everything from like hands on tips or general advice or all kinds of things. Um, now, this screenshot I have here is from Jeff Schaefer. So he shared some um, quick fire Tableau tips because kind of like that. He often does that at a conference. This was really great to see. We saw other people sharing maybe just a singular tip, but in more detail. Um, but it was just really great to see um, all the Zen masters come together and share some unique perspectives uh, and tips that again you can apply in your own work so I always see this as an extension of the speed tipping session because there was lots of stuff in here in a similar vein okay so this all, most of what I presented today was taken from my blog so I, I, I wrote a blog after TC which covered more of the community aspect. So I spoke in detail on the blog around the sessions I've just mentioned, as well as things like brain dates um, and other kind of activities that happened at conference. So if you want to check that out, you can find that on my blog, um, sarahlovesdata.co.uk. And um, yeah, I just want to big, say a big thank you to everyone um, for joining me today. Thank you to Atlanta Tug for having me. Uh, thank you to Karen for accepting my uh, request to speak. Uh, and then if you want to reach out to me, you can find me um, at Sarah Loves Data on Twitter or sarahlovesdata.com as well. Oh, sorry, it's, that's actually wrong. It's sarahlovesdata.co.uk is my website. Uh, but thank you everyone. And I hope you um, enjoy the session. That was awesome, Sarah. Thank you so much. And I love the codes. I don't know if you guys were scanning those, but that was really, really helpful. Like during a virtual call, I, I haven't seen anyone do that before, but it was really, really useful. This was Thank great. You. Yeah. I've, seen, I've seen someone do it before. So I was like, let me just do that because it's so much easier and I've got a ton of links otherwise. Um, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's hard to get the whole link sometimes. So that's perfect. Yeah. Sarah, that um, was incredible. There's so much that I want to go back and rewatch and unpack and, and so, everyone's asking you know, people are asking for what links and and so the fact that you wrap that up in a nice with a big bow of here's my blog post it gives all of that I, I just yeah. sent the link to the blog post everyone so in that. fact th this QR code at the end it actually takes you to the slides so you you'll go to the slides and then from there okay. um you'll have the QR codes oh, nice. if, yeah so it kind of does it goes full circle <laughs> well, I, so, I, I mean, I feel like I just went to the conference all over again. <laughs> and, it, it, and Nelson, it feels like such a long time ago. Like when I was putting this together, I was like, wow, it feels like months ago. And it was only like, what, a month ago? Time um, flies. So it's a nice refresher. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So good. Thank you so, so much. I asked in the chat if anyone has questions, but feel free to add any questions in the Q&A if you have any. And I'll be sure to ask them. Um, Sarah, I know you mentioned like brain dates a few times. Mm -hmm. and I those i've really enjoyed the brain dates as well do you feel like i think there's a lot of folks in atug that don't have the opportunity to go to the conference typically like cannot attend like the company just isn't going to send them you know to the face-to-face -face conference it's pretty expensive and you got to do travel and do you feel like you get a similar experience or doing i mean how do you if you feel like you're unable for whatever reason do you feel like some of those things kind of like could help like bridge that gap kind of yeah absolutely i think brain dates is the closest you're going to get to meeting people in person right and and i think brain dates are even better than than some the conference experience in some aspects because in at the conference you might see someone in the corridor and you'll just talk about you know random stuff how are you like what you being what sessions are being going to whereas brain dates are tailored conversations around specific topics so you can uh, meet people who have similar interests to you so you can all sit together for I don't know how long it is maybe 40 minutes to talk about that one topic and get all the experts in the same room whereas a conference is very difficult it might you might want to meet multiple people but you can't find them all and then you don't have those conversations so yeah absolutely I'd say, I'd say definitely take advantage of the brain dates and they aren't just limited to TC so that Tableau run them I think on a quarterly basis now so if you miss them at TC don't worry there'll be some more brain dates coming up in the new year where you can get involved. Sarah one of the things that um, I have experienced and be interested in your take of like, I think the first few times you go to conference, like you're like, hey, I want to learn as much as I can, session, session, session. And then there's kind of like this transition of like, I want to meet more people. And then to your point, like, I think you get to a point where it's like, man, I want to do brain dates on these things or like make sure I connect with this person or whatever. Like, as you've gone through your journey, like 
can you like is that a similar journey to like what you've experienced then like kind of how do you feel like as you go through like I think as we think about because I'm excited you know Tableau is kind of saying hey it could be late spring early summer and we get to do this thing all over again but like as we prime that a little bit like would you would you kind of say like first two conferences like kind of do this and then like with your third or fourth kind of do this like any guidance to the folks out here on yeah absolutely yeah so um my first conference was um the back then it was a london like tc back in i want to say 2015 maybe yeah 2015 i think it was i went to that conference i spoke to nobody the entire time literally went there i was completely on my own i went to a lot of hands-on sessions as you described nelson so the kind of like sessions where you could like deep dive on calculations um, and really learn something thoroughly um, and I didn't have a good time right it was it was just I, I didn't really know the community existed I think I went up to Andy Creeble actually and was like oh you're Andy Creeble like, like he was a celebrity which was like really embarrassing um, but he was like the only person I recognized because I followed his blog and back then like the community wasn't such a big deal as it is now um, but on the back of that I joined Twitter and that's kind of like how I discovered the community um, my first US conference was um, Austin 2016, um, and I had a, a bit of a unique experience in the sense that I actually won a ticket through the Information Lab uh, through a competition they ran at the Europe conference earlier that year. So I kind of buddied up with them, and so I was really lucky that I kind of went to the conference with Zen Masters and they kind of knew everyone. And they, I was just like tagged along and just met all these people as a result, but I still went to those kind of like deep dive sessions and like to learn about LODs and that kind of thing. Um, and as, as just as you described Nelson, as I've kind of progressed, I've moved, <laughs> my focus has shifted and I thought, you know, I'm not going to go to sessions. I can watch those later. I want to really maximize those in-person kind of experiences, whether that be brain dates or going out for dinner or just having like one-on-one -on -one conversations with people that I've not seen for a long time. So I'd say if you are going to conference for the first time, um, and maybe you don't know anyone, I would say balance, do a, balance it out because you can always watch sessions back later. So just try and maximize that in-person experience. If try go to brain dates, meet with people you don't know, chances are you'll, you'll make friends. There'll be other people in the same situation as you or you can you know, hang out with them for the rest of the conference and just really maximize those chances to meet people that you wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to meet in person. I love that, that's so good. It, your story reminds me, and uh, some of you in ATEG land may know of her, but Michelle Gaudet, um, was somebody that like Tom Brown like put his arm around like like I don't know anybody here I just want to meet people and he's like well come here and like he like walked her around I want to say in like 2018 mm -hmm. yeah I was became, I remember like, Michelle yeah yeah. And so yeah yeah he was she like became like instant you know following everybody on Twitter and now she's like this rock star she's awesome um, yeah she's yeah. a good friend and, and friend of ATUG so and Anna knows her very well so yes uh, I love that story and yeah it's yeah. absolutely right go go meet people uh i love that so super cool yeah and it was just like that because tom actually called me and said i'd won and i thought it was a wind up like i was convinced that he was some kind of joke <laughs> but yeah, it well, wasn't so cool All and right. I, well, I would, and, and i would add to that is um one thing that i learned also in addition to what you said that you can always watch the um the recordings later you can also always sleep later you don't need it during the yes you can sleep later that's the extrovert. Yeah. Anna and I are the extroverts. Uh, and Karen too, actually. Frank. You, you're stuck with the two of us. But like the extroverts, will, you'll sleep when we get home, right? Like the introverts yeah. are like so too many much people, going on. So many people. <clears throat> but yes, uh, I'm totally with you. Yeah. yeah. And I totally, I, like normally after... I like three hours sleep at conference. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was going to say, one, one, one year I didn't even go to bed. We just carried on like all through, all through the night into the <laughs> <Wow>. next day. <laughs> Yeah, you'll yes. regret it later. It'll be great. <clears throat> awesome. Well, so this has been so much fun. Thank you so much. Thank um, you.